Welcome back to Virginia Pustrell, columnist for Bloomberg View. So far this week, we've been taking a look at the pressures on the individual in the evolving modern world, the differences between us and the many options at our disposal. Well, tonight we look forward to discuss the individual's role in collective progress. Hi, Virginia. Hi. So it's been about a dozen years or so since you wrote uh, your book, The Future and Its Enemies, but it has been a book with staying power. And in it, you talk about this desire, this, this need, this human urge to improve things. Give me some examples of what you mean by that. Well, you can pretty much use anything. <laughs> you can use uh, something as uh, simple as, or, or you know, pervasive as computer technology. I mean, how many times have you used your computer and thought, why does it do that? <laughs> uh, this is a, a technology that's been developed through a lot of incremental improvements to a point that is compared to, say, 20 years ago, it's very graceful, and yet you think, well, I want it to be able to do this when I turn it on. I don't want to have to take. I don't want to have to wait for it to boot up. I want it to come on instantly. And this is something that I new, want. newer and, and newer versions are starting to be able to do this. So that whenever we have an object, uh, and and I use that in the sense of the object of the verb. It doesn't have to literally be an object. We tend to have dissatisfactions, and we think about how could it be improved. Take a different example. Uh, your parents raised you a certain way. And when you were a kid, you thought, boy, when I have kids, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's, you know, that's mean. That's bad. You become a parent, and in many cases, you might actually implement some of, some of those things. Other ones, you may realize once you're a parent why your parents did that. But, uh, and so we have swings. So, you know. The baby boomers were raised a certain way. They raised their children a slightly different way. Those kids will change it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, you have, not everything. I'm not talking about change for change's sake. I'm not talking about throwing everything out and starting from scratch, uh, but rather looking for incremental improvement. Does this urge to improve sort of underpin the Western notion that we have of progress? I believe that it does, that in fact, uh, that progress properly understood is not a progress toward a specific goal. Now that is a competing notion of progress, is that you know, we know what the perfect society looks like and we're going to set out to get there. This is a different kind of notion of progress. This is a much more modest notion, but at the same time, much more open-ended and infinite. I mean, there is, you can get a kind of vertigo from this sort of notion of progress, which is that each, each type of progress leads to new dissatisfactions, which then lead to new improvements, and that's the case whether you're talking about artifacts, technologies, uh, scientific theories, uh, new forms of art, uh, Whatever it is uh, produces, whatever is today leads to whatever is tomorrow. Your book, at, at the center of it, is sort of this idea of uh, outlining the political landscape and sort of abandoning or changing, if you will, the traditional idea that we have of this left and right politics. And you, you argue that there's a, a new political spectrum, if you will. What does that look like? Well, what I argue in the future and its enemies is that for many issues, you can think about the uh, the political landscape as being divided between what I call uh, dynamists, which are people who look for this kind of open-ended progress and uh, value this kind of discovery and learning, and the and value the institutions that lead to that, which are. Uh, relatively simple rules that allow a lot of competition, uh, a lot of diversity, and a lot of feedback about what works, uh, versus what I call stasis and the dominant version of that in actual politics are people who uh, have various technocratic schemes. In other words, they say, I like progress, I'm for progress, here's my 14-point plan for exactly how we get there, and we're going to have one best way for everybody. There's also less influential in politics, but certainly influential in the world of ideas, uh, another form of stasis, which is more like a reactionary back to the 
once upon a time there existed a perfect static society and um, we want to go back to that. So the two groups look at progress differently. differently. And, yeah. and you see this on a lot of different kinds of issues where you'll often see um, odd, what look like odd alliances. So for example, uh, on immigration you'll have uh, people who uh, like free markets, so you might say, oh, they're on the right, and yet they like immigration, and that seems like they're on the left, uh, they, they might go together, or, or on technological issues, on how do you feel about the development of biotechnology. Uh, there you will often, you know, you'll see people who uh, seem to be on the left, uh, they seem to be allied with environmentalists, and yet they take an attitude toward uh, biotechnology, particularly uh, biomedical technology that allies them with people who are against abortion, who would seem to be on the right. Uh, so, and, and what is uh, sometimes driving those is an underlying view about progress. You argue that people like Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Pat Buchanan, are leaders or politicians, men who are afraid of the future, you know, people who believe that they're capable of making better decisions than we as a general population are. So I want to ask you today, who do you see as modern day uh, stasis in politics? Well, there's been a resurgence. Bill, first of all, Bill Clinton is a difficult person to classify this way because his administration, he has conflicting impulses. There is a very strong a uh, technocratic element, but there was also, particularly around the internet, for example, there was also within his administration uh, a, a more dynamist element. So what he as an individual is like, I don't know, but, but uh, as, as an administration, it was complicated. But what has happened since, re really in the last few years, has been a resurgence of something that I really thought had mostly gone by the board, which is, um, in, in U.S. politics, an actual yearning for, um, for lack of a better term, central planning, which, you know, whether it was the left or the right, or there was there was less of a sense of we're going to have one best way and impose it on everybody. It was much more incremental. Say back mm -hmm. in the Clinton administration, uh, I was sort of working on the book during the first Bush administration and and, and the Clinton administration. Um, there has been much more notion that you know we want the government to pick winners. We want that instead of believing that technological progress can come in ways we don't expect, we're going to have an, an initiative to produce green jobs uh, a, a, as opposed to allow Silicon Valley to figure out where uh, where the how the future will em emerge in a more competitive uh, landscape. And this has produced a kind of crony capitalist er st a stage uh, ret return to that. And that is really surprising and disturbing. And uh, again, the people who are most associated with it are Democrats, but it didn't start with the Obama administration. Uh, I have an article on Bloomberg View uh, my most recent column, uh, as of this taping, uh, anyway, uh, is about light bulb mandates. Um, if you want to reduce emissions, carbon dioxide or other pollutant kind of emissions, uh, the, la the most inefficient possible way to do it is to say, say what kind of light bulbs people should buy. You want to do it at the source. Uh, you want it so that clean power pays less of a price than dirty power. Uh, you want to tax emis emissions, not prescribed technologies, but we're in this moment where it's all about prescription. Yesterday we talked about Obama. Now you just said that Bill Clinton was pretty hard, it's pretty hard to categorize into one of these two groups. Where does Obama fit in? Well, Obama actually, I think, fits of uh, very much into uh, the, the stasis category, and in a, in a, judging from his autobiograph, autobiography, in a fairly deeply emotional way. Um, in uh, Dreams from My Father, he 
writes about economic change in a way that is entirely negative, which is really interesting hmm. from a guy who seems like such a progressive in, in, in other ways. Uh, he sees it as uh, entirely uh, devastating to communities and uh, disruptive of, of sort of settled lifestyles. I'm not saying that's the primary theme of the book. The primary theme of the book is about his identity and about race. But when he writes about uh, economic dynamism, it is quite negative in a way that you would not have seen from, say, a Bill Clinton. When you write about types of economic progress in your book, things that we can't foresee uh, that's based on chance is something that you say. What do you mean by that? Well, the, this goes back to what I was talking about, about the difference between the idea of progress as we know exactly what the future must look like. Uh, you know, we will have flying cars and we will all live in 500 story high rises and we will have a you know planned economy run by a computer. Uh, that's, that's, obviously this is kind of silly, but those kind of ideas were out there. That's one notion of progress is you're marching toward a destination. The, the idea that I'm arguing for is a much more emergent process. There is so much knowledge scattered in society. We talked earlier in the week about individual difference. Nobody's normal. Well, everybody has a different, uh, different taste, different preferences, different uh, values but also different knowledge, uh, knowledge of their particular circumstances, knowledge of what they're capable of, knowledge of what problems they have. And what you want to do in uh, thinking about an economic or social system is to find ways that tap that knowledge. But the, mere, but the fact that it is so dispersed means that you don't really know what the outcome is going to be. You don't, uh, you don't know the next thing that's going to be invented and you don't know uh, sort of what, uh, what that might disrupt also that, that's settled. So you, know, you don't know that there's going to be Facebook, or you don't know that there's going to be blogging, or you, know, you didn't even know there was going to be the internet uh, when you made your plans for your, you know, your career or your, your business. And so it, it, it is, you're headed toward an unknown future, uh, I argue that it is better, as a, in general, more people have more opportunities, more people have uh, longer lifespans, uh, more, more choices, more, uh, more goods, what, whatever, uh, different, uh, more ability to find what it is they want in life. Um, but that does not mean there are not losers, because at any given point, uh, it's disruptive, and anything that's disruptive creates losers as well as winners. You know, progress and change go hand in hand, and, and creativity uh, yields change. Yeah. And, and that change, you argue, is a very good thing, and that we should embrace that. Are there examples that you see in our world today uh, of change that, you know, might not be good for humanity's betterment? <laughs> well, first of all, I think you have, this is why I use the word dynamism, even though it's kind of a, it's, it's a word, I didn't yeah. invent it, although I did invent dynamis and stasis, but I don't like to just say change because there are all sorts of sources of change and there is change that is imposed. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, change that is emergent and there's change that's not. And there are different kinds of change. So, and, and certainly, I mean, you know, when we take, you know, if, 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 if somebody attacks your country or, or a robber comes into your house, that's change. It changes the circumstances. But it's not mm. change that you're going to welcome. Uh, so so the, take an extreme example with, with, with violent change. Uh, so, so that is uh, one aspect of it. It's, 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 that's, it. it's really about a system and a system of discovery. And, Earlier in the week, we talked a little bit about social criticism. And one, um, one point that I sometimes make is that often a valid social criticism, that is a social criticism that is shared by many people, pe many people agree with it, 
is uh, represents an entrepreneurial opportunity, not just to sell your books of you know why the world is going to hell in a handbasket <laughs> by Virginia Postrel. No, I don't really think that. But but in fact, for an actual business. So for example. Um, there was a book called The Great Good Place, uh, which talked about uh, how uh, in the US, uh, what the author called third places were disappearing. And third place is neither home nor work, but is a pub, a barbershop, sure. a gathering place where people engage in social contact that's not necessarily oriented toward a work goal, but neither is it within the intimacy of their family. Well, there were a lot of people who shared that feeling. I mean that and they not some of them bought the book, but most of them never even heard of the book. Um, but one of the people who bought the book was Howard Schultz who started Starbucks, Starbucks and he already had the company. It was not the original strategy of the company, but they decided they're going to push this strategy uh, to create environments uh, that would create that third place. And now all kinds of businesses do it, and people who hate Starbucks, uh, you know, again, open up competing uh, businesses, uh, coffee shops that have maybe a little more local feel. Uh, but that's an example of a kind of social criticism that's out there that taps a dissatisfaction that leads to a change in response to a mm. previous change that people were dissatisfied with. Another one is uh, the overwhelming variety that we talked about earlier in the week, uh, which is leads to various ways of helping people to take advantage of variety but not be overwhelmed. Okay, Virginia, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for a terrific week of conversation. Thank you.